start with a little bit of ground rules, though so, um, I recognize some familiar names and faces, so maybe you all are, are used to our, uh, our song and dance. Um, we are the initial portion of the program. We're gonna be hearing from Claire, so we will place everyone in auto mute. And then when we get to the interactive portion of the program, um, that's when we can have, uh, we can, you can unmute yourself to ask a question. You can also type a question in the chat um, during the program while it, as it comes, uh, you know, as it comes to your mind, um, as Claire's speaking, and then at the end, we'll circle back and make sure everything in the chat is addressed. And the chat button is on the bottom black bar. Um, if you have private questions, you can direct them um, to me. Otherwise, if you choose everyone, uh, the entire crowd here will be able to see your question. So let's see, I'll do um, two quick introductions before I introduce Claire. Um, so our two ambassador hosts today are here. We're excited to see Judy and Perry. If you two could wave, there you are. And um, Judy and Perry are our longtime ambassadors um, and they are, our uh, hosts for this program. Um, we really want to make sure that the voice of the Parkinson's community is represented. Um, uh, so we do our best to put on, you know, programming from the sp staff perspective, but we also want, you know, directly um, to, to have the, the voices represented of, of people who are um, impacted by Parkinson's and, and living with the disease. So they help us translate that and make sure that we are, um, you know, um, uh, doing a good job and, and representing the, the true uh, feelings of, of the community. And they are always willing to um, answer questions, um, you know, uh, they are they have told me to make sure to share their information you can find them on our website and if you have specific questions or just looking for someone to connect with whether you're recently diagnosed or it's it's been a while um, and something new has popped up or just looking for that uh, extra level of connection um, our ambassadors judy and perry are are there um, for for you, for all of you in the community. Right, guys? As long, okay. I always worry when I put it out there that all of a sudden your, your box is gonna shut off and you're gonna <laughs> run away. Well, I have 4.30 on the dot, so I will go ahead and kick us off. Uh, this is the July installment of our happy hour gathering, our online happy hour therapy break. And hello, and today our, um, our featured guest is Dr. Claire McLean from Orange County, California. She is a physical therapist, um, a DPT, and an NCS, which if I have all of my acronyms at the top of my head, um, a neurologic clinical specialist, Mm -hmm. as, yeah, well, it works. as well as a, a doctor. Uh, she has her doctorate in physical therapy. So um, there are, you know, there's a lot of physical therapists out there and they see all kinds of conditions, but, you know, the, the DPTs and the NCSs, um, you know, really have that advanced training and, um, you know, advanced credentials specific to neurologic diseases like Parkinson's. So we're so excited to have her share her time and her expertise. And I hear that your angle for today, Claire, is exercise is medicine for the mind, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So who, uh, by, a, by a wave of hands, who believes that? Who thinks exercise is medicine? Yes? I just like to see all the, the boxes move and see your smiling faces. So thank you for indulging me there. And um, let's see. My name is Andrea Merriam. I'm the 
uh, community engagement director at PMD Alliance. So we are the organization that puts together um, our, this online program and many others like it. And we are so glad to have you. And with that, I will uh, kick it over to you, Claire, to go ahead and, and start to introduce the topic. And as a reminder, for those who just joined in this beginning portion, we're gonna hear from Claire and leave you in um, uh, the auto mute setting. And then when, um, when she has introduced her topic, we will open it up for interactive questions. So save your questions and we will all have a, a chance to, to chime in and participate in just a bit. So off to you, Claire. There we go. Okay, I was, it wasn't letting me unmute myself. <laughs> It was under the host control. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. Um, it's really exciting to see so many people on this call. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a super passionate physical therapist um, who loves working with people with Parkinson's and helping them improve and see what they're capable of and really um, have a huge impact on Parkinson's over the long term. So uh, just a little bit more background about me. Um, I went to University of Southern California for physical therapy school, which is mostly important because while I was in PT school there, um, the first study was published that actually showed positive brain change for people with Parkinson's due to exercise. So before that, it was, you know, not that long ago, 15 to 20 years ago, it was thought that exercise maybe wasn't good for people with Parkinson's because they thought that exercise might actually cause people to use their dopamine faster. And so that's an old school thought, old school thought now, but for a long period of time, that was kind of what was thought. And so when people were diagnosed with Parkinson's, they were told to kind of take it easy, relax, you know, don't stress yourself out, don't push yourself too much. Um, and then that started to shift in the 2000s. There was a lot of research happening with exercise in the brain for other diagnoses. So people who've had a stroke showing how much recovery they could have, people with a spinal cord injury or brain injury. So these are all you know, diagnoses and um, in different ways that affect the nervous system and the brain. And so it was showing more and more that the brain can actually change and improve throughout the lifespan. So it's not like we peak in our 30s and then it's all downhill from there, which also was a thought at one point in time. It's that our brain can continue to respond and improve and grow in response to our lifestyle. So the types of situations that we put ourselves in. So if we continue to learn and move and try new things and challenge ourselves, our brain will respond to that. So there was this study published at USC that was a treadmill training study, high intensity. So people were pushed to work out um, on the treadmill at a heart rate uh, between 60 to 80% of heart rate max. So they were sweating, they were out of breath. Um, they did use a harness in that study. So people had a harness on them. So just in case they lost their balance, they could, they would be caught. And that is something that can be used for safety. Um, but otherwise, people were really pushing themselves, working hard. And they showed that in this study, um, they used a technique called, uh, a way to study the brain called transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. And this is a way to measure brain activity. And so in healthy controls, there's a certain type of brain activity that's actually a little bit calmer than people with Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's have what would be called hyperexcitability. So in this study, the people with Parkinson's who did intensity exercise actually had improvement where they had less hyperexcitability and their brains were functioning more like healthy controls. And so that is our goal is to, in many different ways, to get people with Parkinson's functioning similar to people in their age range who don't have Parkinson's and people you know, who are healthy and active. So this study was published while I was going to physical therapy school. And I, in, for physical therapy, even doctors of physical therapy, which is most people graduating now have a doctorate, you still graduate as a generalist. So you're supposed to be a little bit good at almost everything, but physical therapy really has wide ranging um, 
you know, people who we work with. So you can work with pediatrics, you can work with athletes, you can work with um, people with orthopedic conditions, whether it's post-surgery or injuries. Neurologic physical therapy is actually a pretty small specialty within physical therapy overall. And then within neurologic physical therapy, there are many different diagnoses that all are very different from each other. So someone who's had a spinal cord injury and someone who has Parkinson's have completely different types of um, things that they're working on and injuries. So even within neuro, I started working with people with Parkinson's and decided to specialize even further because I saw that people could get better when they were pushed and they were telling me, you know, I've tried physical therapy before. It never really made that much of a difference. And I started working with them using the research that I'd learned and people started getting better. And I was like, okay, I want to do this. This is fun. It's cool to see people get better. And they're really at that time, which was 12 years ago, there were not very many physical therapists who specialized working with people with Parkinson's. There are more now, which is great. That's one of the things that um, myself and many other organizations are working on is trying to train more and more physical therapists to really specialize and understand what's going on with Parkinson's. Um, so I went to PT school and then I did a neurologic residency program um, to specialize further in neuro and got my NCS. And then since then, I've pretty much worked almost exclusively with people with Parkinson's. I've worked um, in outpatient settings, in a hospital and private practice. I've worked on research studies. Um, I work with nonprofit organizations like PMD Alliance and then Power or Parkinson Wellness Recovery, which is also based in Tucson um, and in Arizona. So there's a lot of cool things going on and I like to be involved in a lot of different things. And I think that gives me a really good breadth of experience. And then working almost exclusively, I've seen a lot of people. I also like attending other meetings and there's just so much to learn. And there's so many different ways that you can help people, not just through physical therapy and exercise, but we also often are the ones who let people know about speech therapy or occupational therapy and help people figure out how to talk to their doctor about medications because we get to more time with people. And so we kind of see you at different times of the day and in different circumstances, and we can help you kind of figure out, you know, how to talk to your doctors about things and really optimize your overall care. So there's really a lot that physical therapists can do, which is um, really rewarding as a career. Um, so that is a little bit more about me. Um, lastly, kind of what I'm doing now is I still continue to work on some research projects and work with um, power teaching courses for them. Um, and then I started actually a wellness program in Orange County. I was working in a hospital, outpatient hospital system. We had a great therapy team. We had movement disorders, neurologists at this community hospital. It was a really great place to work. And we saw, you know, people get better in physical therapy. And we had started doing some classes that people could continue in after physical therapy. Because we found for a lot of people after they'd done one-on-one -on -one PT and we tried to discharge them to home with a home exercise program, for a lot of people, it was difficult for them to continue. They didn't necessarily know exactly what to do or how to do it. And the thing with exercise is you can't just do the same thing forever. For one, that's boring. And then that doesn't help you get better. So exercise really needs to be progressive. So you need to do certain things for a while and then you need to try new things and more challenging things. And that's how you actually get better. But to ask someone to do that on their own is really a lot to ask anyone, much less someone who has Parkinson's. You know, Olympic athletes are very good at what they do, and nobody says, okay, like, I helped you for a little bit, now take this paper and go exercise on your own. Like, it's just not realistic. Um, so anytime someone's really wanting to improve, we need coaching and support and to be able to ask questions and problem solve. And if something hurts, you know, no, is this something that is an injury or is this something where my body's just getting used to new activities and I need to push myself and kind of work through it. So having somebody that's kind of a coach really helps you be able to figure out those things. Because with Parkinson's, there's a lot of good reasons not to exercise. You might feel tired. You might not feel well. You might have a hard time, you know, getting places where you can go to exercise. So there are a number of barriers that we really want to, um, phone is ringing. We really want to try to break down those barriers and help people get better access. So at this hospital, we started some classes for people to continue in after their individual therapy, and we were doing some testing with these people in terms of their balance and their walking and mobility, and we saw that people were getting better over the course of time instead of worse. Parkinson's is a progressive neurologic condition, so the expectation is that things get worse. And so when we saw that people over the course of a year or two, a pretty good amount of time, were actually getting better 
we're like, okay, we got to do more of this. So we had a few classes there and then really we had maxed out what we could do at the hospital. And I wanted to add more classes. We had more people, but we didn't have the space um, and staffing, you know, physical therapy and the other therapies were the priority. So that's when I decided to leave the hospital and start my own program outside the hospital to bring exercise into the community so that people can access it easier. It's more flexible. Um, it's something where someone can call me up and we can meet and go over their exercise program or do an assessment. There aren't multiple steps and a long wait to get into therapy. Um, and I wanted to have a program where exercise was more accessible on an ongoing basis. So we know that kind of this model of physical therapy for a couple months and then no physical therapy. And then some, again, a little bit, that model, physical therapy is definitely helpful, but that is not enough for people to really maximize what they can get out of exercise. And it's great. I mean, there definitely is a lot that you can do on your own, but I just would recommend working with someone in some capacity who could help kind of push you um, to do a little bit more than what you feel comfortable with and keep, you know, setting goals and working towards reaching those because that really makes a big difference. Um, so at this point, I'm working out of a gym and we have 18 classes a week and about 80 people with Parkinson's who come every week to exercise. Um, and we're doing assessments as part of our program as well. So every six months, we do a pretty comprehensive assessment looking at balance, walking endurance, walking speed, functional mobility, um, cognition, fine motor dexterity, a whole bunch of different things. And so we're able to see where someone's at when they get started, set some goals, and then keep checking in on that every six months which um, I think is a teeny bit stressful sometimes for people when they're coming in it's assessment time because people want to do well. Um, but for the most part, when they see how well they're able to do and what areas they've improved in, that's really rewarding for them to see as well as for me. And then in some cases, if there is something that isn't as good as it was before, we're able to say, okay, why not? Is this something you need to talk to your doctor about? Is this something that you know another professional would help with or do we need to tweak your exercise program? but it allows us to be more proactive because we catch things early when there's just a mild change and then we can do something about it. Um, so that's been really um, helpful as well to do those assessments. So those are some of the things that I would recommend for all of you out there is one, if you've never had physical therapy before, definitely you want to do some physical therapy. Even if you're recently diagnosed and you feel like, you know, my symptoms are mild, um, my doctor hasn't told me I should have physical therapy. That's exactly when we want to get started because we're trying to be preventative. So we want to get you as early as possible, get you started on a good program, do some baseline assessments. And if we find that all those assessments look really good, you're at age match norms, then we just need to put together a good exercise program that you can continue with. Maybe see if you have access to classes or something else in your community, potentially participate in those, but really try to start early and consider it more as preventative medicine. If you have already noticed some change in your posture or in your movement or balance, then physical therapy, the goal would be for it really to be rehabilitative. So we want to get you, we want to get all those things better, as good as possible in physical therapy, and then have you continue on your own. Um, so attending some physical therapy as soon as possible is something that is very important for everyone. And then I recommend that people do a physical therapy assessment at least once a year. Um, it's good to go back in and just check on those assessments, maybe tweak your exercise program, see if there's anything new or different that you want to add, um, and kind of see where you're at. Because sometimes, you know, it can go both ways. Sometimes people will say, I really feel like I'm not doing well. And when we test things, it's better than they expected to be. And that's a little bit of a relief and hopefully still motivation to really keep pushing. Or someone may say everything's fine, but we actually notice on that assessment something has changed that allows us to address it. Rather than kind of the traditional way that people have been referred to physical therapy in the past is neurologists often have waited until something happens like a fall or an injury or a hospitalization where someone then has this decline in function and that's when they're referred. And that is an important time to be referred as well, but our goal is to get people started earlier to hopefully prevent that fall, prevent that hospitalization or decline in function. Um, so that's kind of the model that we're trying to approach things on more is a more preventative model now. And then, you know, being able to touch base, have a resource of a therapist that you can ask questions to. Um, and although I'm talking, you know, pretty much only about physical therapy, this holds true for physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. All three disciplines are extremely helpful, and I would highly recommend early assessments and a little bit of therapy, and then having somebody that you can touch base with over time. Um, and for that physical therapist, it is ideal if you can work with someone who has 
more experience and additional training working with people with um, Parkinson's? And I see that question, Judy. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, so it is very helpful to work with someone, uh, a physical therapist or any of the therapists who have special experience with Parkinson's. Um, there's some really cool data actually out of the Netherlands, which has a system called ParkNet, where there are a whole bunch of healthcare professionals who have had a lot of additional training and experience working with people with Parkinson's. And then there are still all the other physical therapists who aren't necessarily part of that program. And they actually just published a study recently that showed that the people who went to a Parkinson's specialist therapist had better outcomes. They had less adverse events like a fall or an injury or a hospitalization. And they also, they did that in less visits. So the physical therapy they got was actually more efficient. They didn't need as many visits, but they actually had better outcomes in less visits. So data like that is really cool to see because it makes sense to me that it, you know, it helps to see a specialist, but it's good to have data like that that supports it. Um, but it's true that not everybody necessarily has a physical therapist um, who specializes in Parkinson's in their area, or you might not know how to find one. So a couple ways to find them. One is there are um, two kind of main therapy programs that have developed, been developed specifically for people with Parkinson's that therapists get trained in. One is called LSBT Big, and the other one is Power. And Power Moves are the specific exercises. So both of these organizations, which if you Google LSBT Big, or Parkinson Wellness Recovery, both of those organizations have websites where you can search for a therapist who has been trained by them. So that is one way that's really good to find people who have additional training and likely have more experience working with people with Parkinson's. You also can search on the American Physical Therapy Association um, has a website as well where you can look for a therapist. And in that case, they, it may not be specific to Parkinson's, but you could at least find someone who is a neurologic specialist. And so someone who at least has more experience than the average um, therapist working with people with neurologic conditions. So depending on the area where you're in, sometimes you may not have someone who's highly specialized, but someone who at least has more experience in neuro is a good place to start. And then I would encourage you in your area, if the therapists that you have been able to find or know haven't necessarily taken those courses, I would highly recommend that you let them know that those courses exist and that it would be a great idea for them to go and get trained because they could be a huge resource to the community. And I'm sure even if you're in a somewhat rural area or smaller town, there are likely quite a few people with Parkinson's there who really could benefit from the specialty training um, from a physical therapist. So Judy, your question about a specific exercise program such as Bigger Power, that's a great question. So when I graduated from PT school in 2007, I actually took the very first LSVT big course that was ever taught. So I met Becky Farley, who's the physical therapist who developed the LSVT big program. And um, that was actually my research project as my, for my residency program was to do a case study for someone and use the LSVT big program. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the LSVT big program, the therapy protocol that was developed, um, Becky Farley is a physical therapist in, in Arizona who developed it. And it is based off of the LSVT loud program, which is a speech therapy program that has been around for many, many years and has a lot of data and research to support it. So um, Becky Farley saw a presentation on LSVT Loud, and it's this idea that with Parkinson's, the amplitude of people's movements and their voice decreases. That's one of kind of the main symptoms. And so the speech therapy program had addressed that specifically in saying, if we train people to speak louder, they are not only able to be louder, but they can be more clear, and they see a lot of other spread of effects, like improved facial expression and improved gesturing and other things that sometimes can be diminished in Parkinson's. So Becky saw this presentation and was like, we got to apply this to physical therapy. Because prior to that, there was some general exercise for people with Parkinson's, but there wasn't really anything really trying to address those specific symptoms of slower or smaller movements. And so Becky developed, it's a core set of seven exercises. And um, then you work on other functional activities that's relevant to the person. And you work walking and things like that. And this is a protocol where to do the true LSVT big program, you have to go to therapy four times a week for four weeks. So that is the protocol that was researched. And that is what has been shown to work. And one of the things that actually just back to my title of exercise is medicine. One of the problems with physical therapy and exercise is that it is severely underdosed. So most people are not doing enough of it to really experience the benefits. And it's a perfect analogy with Parkinson's because probably many of you are on some medication that helps with symptoms, whether it's carbidopa levodopa or dopamine agonist. 
And for many of those medications, you are required to take them multiple times a day because there's a certain dosage that works and then it works a certain amount of time. And you know that if you don't take it, let's say you're supposed to take it three times a day and you only took it one time a day, or you took it every other day, it would not work as well. And it's the exact same thing with exercise. Exercise is something that ideally needs to happen every day. The more you move, the better you feel. It's dose responsive. And so that was one of the special things about the LSVT Big Program is because of that protocol where people were required to come four times a week for four weeks, there were much improved outcomes really compared to any other physical therapy program before. Because physical therapy in most cases is kind of like one to three times a week. Um, you know, right around two times is probably average for people. That's what is kind of convenient to work into your schedule, you know, especially depending on how far you might have to travel to get to therapy. Um, and then let's say you don't feel well, you miss one of those visits. All of a sudden you only had one PT visit that week. And that is basically just not enough to really make a difference. Um, Dr. Mishley is a naturopath up in Seattle, and she's doing some really inter interesting research. And what she has shown in terms of frequency of exercise is that people, if they're doing zero, one, or two days a week of exercise, it doesn't really seem to have a huge impact on their Parkinson's. Definitely, I would say anything is better than nothing, but you probably have to reach a, thir a certain threshold for it to really have a an impact on your Parkinson's. So what she has found is that once people reach three days a week consistently, that's when it really has an impact on their Parkinson's symptoms and how well they're doing in their quality of life. And that each additional day of exercise you do has additional benefits all the way up to seven days a week. So there really is um, no reason not to try to exercise every day. And then we know real life happens. So there may be one day where you don't feel well, or you're super busy and you don't get a chance to exercise. But if your goal is to exercise seven days a week and you miss a day or two, you still have at least five days in. If your goal is to exercise three days a week and you miss a day or two and you've only exercised once, it probably isn't really going to have an impact on your Parkinson's. So that frequency and duration and dosage is really important. That's one of the key components if we're thinking about exercise as medicine. Um, so that was one of the coolest things about LSVT Big is that it really pushed both therapists and people with Parkinson's to do more than they had been doing before and to ask more of each other. Um, so I did use LSVT Big for a number of years, and then I worked really closely with Becky, and she is actually one of my like biggest mentors. And so at a certain point with LSVT Big, Becky is an extremely creative person. And so LSVT Big is this protocol, which for certain reasons is excellent because there's some quality control. There are some things that you can kind of control in terms of how it's implemented. Um, but both Becky and I were kind of feeling like, okay, at this point in time, over the past 10 years, there's so much more research that has come out that things like dancing are helpful and boxing is helpful and Tai Chi is helpful. And we wanted to be a little bit more expansive in kind of what we offered people, um, both as therapists and then also in the trainings that we did. And so that's when Becky stop teaching for LSVT Big, which LSVT Big continues on. They do training. They offer a lot of resources. Those are great therapists to see. And then Becky started an organization called Parkinson Wellness Recovery that's based in Arizona. They have a gym in Tucson that is only for people with Parkinson's where they're able to implement this exercise as medicine and to track the results and see what the outcomes are when they really try to take this research and implement it in the real world. And then we also do courses for therapists. So LSVT Big and Power have a lot of similarities. Both of them are based in the idea of amplitude, of we want to push people to move bigger and faster so that their movements are more kind of typical speed and probably the speed you used to move at. With Parkinson's, typically people slow down a little bit and that makes movements less efficient and more difficult. So we want to speed back up, um, not to speed over a natural speed or anything like that. We don't want people to move bigger than what is natural for the movement, but we want you to move a little bit bigger than what feels comfortable so that your movements can be more natural and easy and efficient, and you can do everything that you want to do um, easier and better. So the amplitude component is very similar, and then power is just not a protocol. So we still, we really emphasize the fact that more is better, um, but we also recognize that there's, you know, many different opportunities for people in terms of how much they might be able to access for therapy, depending on where they are and many different things. So we really want the therapist and person with Parkinson's to work together to come up with the best schedule and frequency for therapy, knowing that definitely more is better. And we still are very much big fans of something like an intensive, like LSVT big four times a week for four weeks. Um, 
but we aren't necessarily quite as strict about that four times a week for four weeks. It might be, you know, five times a week for two weeks, and then we wean off or something like that. And then we do another bout. So both of those exercise and therapy programs are effective and helpful. And if you find a therapist trained in either one, um, that will be really great power. The other thing is we utilize a little kind of gym equipment. Um, and so part of our class is more circuit training. So I'd say some people who have come and taken the power course, they may have a little different experience in terms of using certain types of equipment. Um, and there are some little nuances that are different about those programs, but overall, both of them are really good. I pretty much used LSBT big before, and now I tend to focus more on the power moves. Um, I find personally, the power moves are a little bit more modifiable in terms of there's kind of a medium level of the exercise. And then for someone who's athletic, and recently diagnosed, I can ramp that exercise way up and make it more challenging. Or for someone who has had Parkinson's longer or, you know, has a little bit more challenges, I can modify the exercise down so that I can really meet them at the level where they're at and challenge them, but have it be the right kind of challenge point for them. So I am a big fan of both um, sets of exercises, but I tend to use the power moves a little bit more currently. Um, and then let's see, so working with patients who have severe weakness or severe dizziness due to orthostatic hypotension. So one thing is definitely, you know, people working with their neurologists um, with orthostatic hypotension to try to take, you know, medications that are helpful for that as necessary. And then in my experience, what really is helpful is aerobic exercise. So that kind of takes me back a little bit to this whole idea of exercise as medicine what type of exercise do people need to be doing? And the research is really showing that there's two main types of exercise that people need to do. One is aerobic exercise. Aerobic exercise is extremely important for overall health. It's extremely important for brain health. It's what increases blood flow up to the brain so you get the nutrients that you need to make those new connections and new neural pathways. Um, and it's also very helpful for general health. So it helps the cardiovascular system and lungs, joints and muscles and basically everything. So aerobic exercise is very important. And then the other type of exercise that's really important is what we call skill-based exercise. So this is when you're trying to get better at doing something like balancing or boxing is a very skill-based exercise. Power moves in LSVT big are skill-based exercises. We're trying to move bigger and move better and get into different positions. Um, dance is skill-based. So there's kind of two main things, but there definitely is overlap. And walking is one where there's a good amount of overlap in both because walking is something that can be affected by Parkinson's. People may notice that their walking is a little asymmetrical. One step may be shorter than the other, or one arm might not swing as much as the other, or they might feel a little bit less balanced, or sometimes people even have shuffling. So walking could be affected by Parkinson's. And so walking for exercise, you're working both, you know, if we can work it, walk in a way that you get your heart rate up, it can be aerobic exercise, but we can also be saying, okay, walk and let's even out those steps. Let's practice taking big steps, work on arm swing, work posture. We can work on the skill of walking at the same time. Um, so that can be walking on a treadmill or it could be walking outside. Um, so basically just to say that there can be overlap between those two areas of exercise. So if I'm working with someone who has orthostatic hypotension, one thing I would really want to start with is aerobic exercise because aerobic exercise really helps kind of reset the cardiovascular and even the neurologic side of controlled heart rate and blood pressure. So I've had a lot of success with people and initially it might be using something like a bike. If using a treadmill is something that is too challenging, we can definitely start on a bike, a recumbent bike. We can do as little as one minute at a time. But our goal over time is to increase that and to get up to a goal of 45 minutes, actually, of aerobic exercise. That's what most research um, shows to be effective. So I actually, in my practice, have aerobic exercise classes because it is a very important form of exercise. And for a lot of people, even if they physically can do it, it just doesn't happen. Like, I don't do as much exercise as I should myself. Um, and so it helps a lot of people to have somewhere to sign up and go and see people, you know, see your friends and have someone there, a coach who's helping you do more than you would do on your own. Um, so aerobic exercise is one of the main things to do. And then the other thing with orthostatic hypotension is that a lot of times it's changes in position that are challenging. And so many times, you know, as a, a person who's experiencing that, the natural thing to do is to say, okay, I'm not going to change that position. I'm not going to stand up too fast. I'm not going to sit up from lying down too fast because it makes me feel terrible. But unfortunately, the truth is if you want your system to work better, you have to do those things that are challenging. But you do want to do it in a supervised environment so you can make sure that you do those things safely. 
So working with someone with um, orthostatic hypotension, we would be doing a mixture of aerobic exercise and really trying to work up their endurance and monitoring their vitals. And then we actually would be doing exercise like the power moves where we're working on changes in position, but we would be doing at a speed that is challenging but tolerable. And so we don't wanna do something where it makes you feel sick the whole time or make you feel terrible, but we wanna find what's that right level where I can push you to do a little bit more than you feel comfortable with, but you feel okay. And it actually can prove, improve a lot. So I have quite a few people in my classes who have very low blood pressure um, and it improves a lot with exercise. But sometimes you have to start very small and slowly work your way up over time. And a lot of people, it's kind of hard to have patience with that. Like if you're doing it on your own at home, you know, people just want to go and do something and they don't necessarily want to do one minute and then take a little bit of rest and then try to do two minutes. That's kind of like, it takes a lot of patience to do that. And so when you do that with someone, it's helpful. And there's, you can chat a little bit in between, then do a little bit more. And in my experience, people actually do improve pretty quickly after getting started with something like that. Um, yeah. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, I love that. Because first of all, I think we, anything, a one minute segment to start with, you know, that just seems very doable and achievable. And, and then, I, you know, you kind of spoke to the other side of things. Some people, it, it's, it would seem too short and it would be, you know, um, a blip. So, so doing it with a coach or in a class, in a group setting. And I bet your classes are intense because is she a fast <laughs> talker or what? Yeah. I bet they're full of energy and intensity and, and all of that. Um, so thank you. Does that answer your question about the, uh, the low blood pressure, um, Diane, and the, the NOH. I don't see where Diane is here. Uh, yeah. And that is definitely, oh, it, is a, it is a challenge. So it is something where I feel like it's often working with a neurologist or even sometimes a cardiologist, and maybe there are some medications involved in helping raise the blood pressure. And then over time, either, you know, you get to a spot where you're on the right meds and then you feel like you can exercise better or over time as exercise helps you get in better shape, that even sometimes means your medications have to be modified a little bit. And often it means you don't need as much of the medications that raise your blood pressure. So it's a good thing. Um, but it, it can take a while and definitely kind of the more out of shape you're in, it takes a little bit longer to get back into shape. But I have seen amazing improvements. Um, like I have a woman that I work with who's had Parkinson's over 30 years and she's in her 80s now. And uh, about a year and a half ago, she actually had a hospitalization. And when she got back from the hospital, for one, they almost didn't think she was going to survive, but she did. And she got home, but she needed to use a wheelchair full time, which she hadn't been using previously. She was able to walk more. And she really dedicated herself to exercise. And in a period of about four months, she got back to her prior level of function. And so that's where no matter where you're starting from, know that you can get better from wherever you're at now, you can get better, but it is something that's hard to do on your own. So I would say, you know, the more you're unsure of what to do or how to do it, that's when it's really important to work with a physical therapist so that they can help you, you know, get to a point where you can do more on your own. And then maybe something like a class is an option or in physical therapy, it may be that you go to a bout of therapy and then you spend a couple months working on your own. And then it may be that you go back, you know, if you have a skilled need and a medical necessity, then Medicare has, there is a range in terms of what Medicare can pay for. And so um, it's not that Medicare or other insurance are, are going to pay for physical therapy year round, but they're definitely going to pay for a good amount of therapy to help you get better. Um, so if you've had one bout and you started to get better and then you were discharged and now you feel like, oh, that's it. That's not necessarily true. If you keep dedicating yourself and working on your own at home, you're able to go back. And that's actually one of the things that helps us justify to Medicare and other insurances that you sort of deserve more access is if you're putting in some work on your own at home too. So just know that there's a lot of availability um, for that. And it's not like there's this really strict cut off in terms of how much you can get. Um, but it's true that it's not just going to pay for therapy all year round. There has to be kind of bouts at a time. Okay. And then speaking of classes and, and payment, um, Bev and Yuma was asking your opinion about the silver sneakers classes, because a lot of times they're easy to access for free. Yeah. And so with silver sneakers or any class in the community, you know, even if it's something that's Parkinson specific, it really has to be something that's right for you. So if you go and try a class, whether it's silver sneakers or Parkinson's exercise class or something else, 
you should feel that it is challenging. You know, you should have to work hard and think hard, but it should feel safe and doable. So it's hard to say because silver sneakers classes can be all over the board in terms of how intense they are. I've had, you know, people who I know who go to the classes and certain classes they are so intense that it felt borderline unsafe. It, you know, things were moving so quickly or things were so challenging. They felt like this wasn't a good fit for me. I've also had people go to class where they say there wasn't a challenge. You know, there was a lot in sitting or there wasn't much in standing. We didn't get down on the floor and do anything like that. And it wasn't the right level of challenge. So it's not to, you know, it does help in some cases to have it be a Parkinson specific class, but it really needs to be the right class for you and where you're at. And you should feel challenged, but you should feel safe and like you can be successful and do it. So that's really how you can figure out if the class is good for you. So definitely anything that you have access in your community, I would recommend trying it and see how you feel. And if you, you know, you try to attend a class and then it feels like it's a little bit too fast paced or too difficult and you haven't had physical therapy, that's where I'd say go to do some physical therapy and say, this is my goal is to be able to participate in these classes that are in my area and are free through insurance. That's a great option for me. So I want to get to a point through physical therapy that I can do that. Um, so that's what I'd say about silver sneakers. It's, and really any classes, any particular like even a power moves class, or if there's an LSVT big class in your community, not every class is right for every person. So you have to find what's right for you. Um, but definitely I would say you want to be challenged. So don't go to a class, you know, and say, oh, that was kind of hard. I'm not going to go do that. If it was kind of hard. That's a good thing. You want to be in a class that's at least kind of hard. Okay. And that kind of goes to Mr. Smith's question about, is it duration, intensity, or variety? And it sounds probably like you said, every all of the above exactly yeah so duration would be you know any amount of exercise is better than none in a given day it's about 10 minutes that you have to get to to for there to be kind of any physiologic benefit in some studies they've shown like 10 minutes is kind of the minimum um i would say up to two hours of exercise i mean some people do even more than that I would say the goal should be like 30 to 60 minutes in general for exercise. And if you have time and are able to do more, that's great. Um, but 30 to 60 minutes is a great place to start um, in terms of duration. And then frequency, the goal should be every day if possible, knowing that it's not necessarily going to happen every day, but that's the goal. Intensity, there's different ways to look at intensity. So one is heart rate. So there are ways to calculate your heart rate max. So we have our resting heart rate and then based on your age, there's a range um, and somewhere between 60 to 80% of your heart rate max is the range that you ideally want to be working in. And there's even a study that actually shows that closer to 80% was better than 60% um, for potentially slowing Parkinson's down. So the goal is to get up to that intensity. That is not necessarily possible for everyone. So it, it takes, you have to work pretty hard um, to get your heart rate up that high. So that's something that really helps to work with a physical therapist or coach for that as well to assess and see, okay, what would that range be for me? And when I'm exercising, what is my heart rate? If I feel like I'm working at hundred percent max, is my heart rate me me matching that? Um, so it is a really good idea to use some type of monitor for heart rate. Even a Fitbit gives you some information. Or if you're on a machine, usually they're doing some monitoring or you can learn to just check your heart rate, which is probably more accurate in some cases than those monitors are. But some form of monitoring for your heart rate is a good idea. If you're finding that you don't feel like you're able to really influence your heart rate and get it up, that's something that you want to talk to a healthcare professional about. Um, sometimes people have, um, sometimes people have high blood pressure or are, are on certain medications that actually are supposed to blunt your heart rate to control hypertension. So sometimes people are on other medications that influence their ability to, to reach that high um, heart rate. Or sometimes like Parkinson's can affect the autonomic nervous system. So sometimes just in general, it's hard for people to, you know, get their heart rate up that high. And so in that case, we can use something called the rate of perceived exertion. So there's a scale, there's a couple different, one is just zero to 10, which is what I like, because I think that makes the most sense. There's one that's like six to 20, which I just think is a little more confusing, but you rate how hard you're working on a zero to 10 scale. It's like zero is lying down, not working at all. 10 is the hardest you could possibly work. And the goal is to be working around a seven to eight on that as your high intensity exercise. So there's different ways to measure it. Um, so intensity can be measured via heart rate, but also for certain skills like balance, you're not necessarily be getting, be getting your heart rate up when you're working on high level balance activities. So in that case, 
it's a little bit of a different scale. So we aren't necessarily able to measure um, objectively like we can with heart rate. As a physical therapist, I can watch someone though and see how successful they are. And I can kind of grade, is that the right level of challenge? Are you able to do it successfully, but I can see you're working really hard, that's on the upper end, or are you kind of making this look easy, in which case we need to increase the challenge. And the person doing that balance exercise could also rate you know, how intense that balance exercise is from zero to 10. So we measure it that way. Um, and then another thing about intensity is high intensity is a good thing, but you don't necessarily need to do the highest intensity every single day. So that's kind of one place where variety comes into your plan for exercise. So variety could have to do with different types of exercise. So maybe more of the aerobic or cardio exercise. And that is the question from Denise. Aerobic and cardio are essentially the same thing. So both extra where you're trying to get your heart rate up. Um, so there's that type of exercise. There's maybe balance training. There is more kind of dynamic um, training like boxing or dancing or something that maybe is a little bit calmer, but still challenging like Tai Chi or Qigong. That's more of kind of mind body exercise. That type of exercise is really good as well. Then there's amplitude training like LSVT, big and power moves. So a good variety of that type of exercise. Like if you say, okay, in a seven day week, it would be great to do aerobic exercise, let's say three to four days a week. It would be great to do amplitude training three to four days a week. And then I'm going to go to a boxing class. Or I'm going to do something with dance. I'm just going to play music I like and dance around the house. That counts. Um, so that kind of variety in terms of the type of exercise you're doing is important. And then the intensity level can also be variable. So you may say, okay, there's going to be one or two days a week that I really push, you know, on the treadmill or outdoors, I push to my max with walking, or maybe even you're doing intervals with jogging or running or something. Um, and then other days you're going to do more moderate level exercise. So on the treadmill, you know, that speed could be different, or maybe on the more intense days you do an and you're monitoring your heart rate. Um, so definitely you want variety and not every single day has to be the maxed out intensity, but you do want a few days a week um, where you're doing higher intensity and those other days can be a little bit less intense physically in terms of the exercise and maybe a little bit more skill-based. Got it. It's a full-time job. <laughs> it is. I mean, I would say even if you did two, even if people did two hours a day, for one, it is difficult. Like for people who are still working, that is the biggest challenge to fit in exercise because a lot of times for people when they're still working, you know, it just, it even takes a little bit harder just to get work done. And then maybe, you know, if someone is young onset, they might have teenagers and kids at home. So it is hardest, I would say, for people who are still working to fit it in. Um, not that it means that when you're retired, it's easy because many people I know who are retired are sort of busier than they even were when they were working. Um, and you have more places to be more different things but I feel like even if you're only awake for like 14 hours a day if one hour of that could be exercise that doesn't seem unreasonable for me you know if you have that time and even a little bit more but it does you know it is a job to kind of commit yourself to doing it find the resources that you need um, but in my experience what I see in terms of the benefits of how much exercise helps people and allows them to live their life and do everything else that they want to do, it is really worth that time investment to exercise to then be able to live the life that you want to live. And I do see that there is a direct correlation with you know people who really commit to exercise and how much they're doing it, and then how full the rest of their life can be because they have the energy to do it. Um, they you know want to do those things. They feel like they can go in any environment and feel comfortable and not be worried about things or be a little bit uncomfortable. So it really is a good investment of time. Does anyone out there in our audience have, you know, tips or a perspective or a way they think about exercise and, you know, a mindset where they, that, that they've found success with to really work it into their day and have it be part of their regimen? And if you wave, I'll unmute you if anyone wants to, to chime in to kind of to hear from, from your perspective. Any takers? I like, there's one of our um, ambassadors in New Mexico, Marsha, who says she thinks of her Parkinson's as a project like grad school. And when she was in grad school, you know, she did her homework. She made sure that she got, you know, her sleep before her exams and she approaches, you know, living with Parkinson's in the same way. Not always kind of resonated with me, uh, you know, to, to think about it. 
as a project. And like Claire said, you know, as medicine, when your doctor tells you you have to take these pills X number of times a day or a week, you do it. And maybe that's a, what do you guys think? Is that a good way to, to think about exercise? Doing it every time you would, uh, you know, just like you would take your pill? I think, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I, I have to admit lately, I have not been following my own advice. <laughs> but um, I kind of like to fit it in as um, I try to get it done. <clears throat> Excuse me, first thing, and I'm going to lose my voice now. So. <clears throat> I need the loud program. <laughs> um, I try to do my exercise early in the morning before I get involved in my day because once I do that, it, it keeps getting put aside. And um, I, I try to do, as Claire said, to commit to every day because I know I'm not going to make every day. And uh, that seems to help a bit. And luckily for those of us that live here in, in Sun City, we have a, a great program here that um, has a lot of classes. There's something almost every day. And so um, once you pay a monthly fee, you can go as often as you want. So I take it, actually sold my house and moved here <laughs> to, uh, that's how dedicated I am. <laughs> um, so I live like right down the street from where the program is now. So. But it is it is tough even when you're retired because you get it's it's hard to fit it in and and with Parkinson's your body doesn't want to exercise sometimes it just doesn't feel like it has the strength to so you, you sort of have to get beyond that but you know I, I found that um, even days where I feel like staying in bed if I get up and start moving I feel much better so I think. Thanks, Judy. And to move, to be closer to your gym. You know, I know a lot of Tucson people who move to be close to, to Power Gym down there. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. People have wow. moved across the country to live close there. Yeah. So, yeah. And um, it definitely helps to, you know, seek out those resources. Um, maybe you don't have to move, but I'd say otherwise, just, you know, if you're trying to increase the access in your area, you know, reach out and try to find physical therapists or personal trainers, you know, someone who has an interest and, you know, help them find those resources and get trained because there's a lot of people out there who would do it and are interested. They just don't know. And that's, you know, for me, what has supported me both kind of like emotionally and in many ways to go out on my own to start these classes is the clients that I started working with at my hospital job who said, yes, like we want more classes. We want more resources. If you start this, we will come. And so that's what allowed me to feel comfortable to go out on my own to do it. And so, you know, if you can find people in your area and support them, it's a very two way street. You know, they're, my clients are supporting me to get to do what I love and, you know, really feel like I'm having an impact and I get to help them through offering those classes. So definitely encourage you if you don't have something in your area already, that doesn't mean that you can't. Um, and then you can refer those people to come and take our courses. For Power especially, um, we teach Con Ed continuing education courses for physical and occupational therapists. We have another course that is for fitness professionals because we also know that you know, physical therapy and occupational therapy is great, um, but then we also want more resources for people in the community. And many times that will be a fitness professional. It won't always be a physical therapist like myself who has kind of decided to move away from a more traditional setting. But we want those ther physical therapists and fitness professionals to have a more similar language and kind of all be working on the same thing, which makes it easier for people to kind of go back and forth between programs, do some physical therapy, transition to classes in the community, go back to physical therapy if needed, have a check-in. Um, and so that's our goal with Power is really to build that um, across the country and world. Um, and that's a great see. perspective, um, you know, from the other side of the fence about, you know, organize maybe within your support group or your, you know, community or the, the people, you know, your fellow people with Parkinson's that you interact with and, you know, go en masse and try to, uh, so interesting that that's how, you know, kind of the, your experience, Claire. And I think, I, did I see another hand that someone else wanted to chime in? Okay. And I was just going to say too, in terms of exercise and the fact that, you know, with Parkinson's, a lot of times you don't really feel like it. And I'd say that's even true for people who don't have Parkinson's. Most people don't feel like it. And the truth is everybody really needs to be exercising. So there is study after study coming out 
that is showing how important you know exercise and activity is for longevity. And for many people, they may not have Parkinson's, but exercise actually has you know an effect on heart disease. Heart disease is the number one killer in this country. So there's a lot of people, unfortunately, who aren't exercising or taking care of themselves, and they have a heart attack, and that's it. So maybe they don't live with Parkinson's for a long period of time, but if they had chosen to exercise earlier, that probably could have had an impact on their health long term. And something like dementia, which as, you know, whether it's Alzheimer's or different causes, dementia something that's becoming kind of an epidemic in this country and it's a huge burden on families and on the healthcare system and exercise is one of the most important things that people could do to reduce their dementia over the long term so as someone with parkinson's i like to tell people to kind of thank your body for kind of telling you that you need to exercise so that it you know when you exercise hopefully you feel better and you move better so that is your body giving you good feedback and even though your body may also hold you back in some ways maybe doesn't want to go exercise Parkinson's kind of pushing you to exercise more is something that's going to be so helpful not only for your Parkinson's but for your overall health and so try to like you know, kind of switch, shift your mindset a little bit in terms of how you think about it and say, okay, thank you body for reminding me that I need to exercise. And when I feel a little bit more stiff, I know that if I go move, I'm going to feel better. So you can kind of thank your body for that reminder because people who don't have that reminder and aren't exercising are probably going to have some negative consequence at some point in time. It just is a different consequence than not exercising with Parkinson's. Um, I see a couple other questions. So I was just going to answer the one for someone with more advanced Parkinson's or even more atypical Parkinson's like progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, so this question was that in physical therapy, you know, they've worked in some home therapy, but that person has trouble standing and P physical therapy is preparing to close due to lack of progress. So one point I want to make is that currently physical therapy should not end due to a lack of progress. There was a big class action lawsuit actually for people with a number of different diagnoses, but um, I think Parkinson's one was one of the included diagnoses of people who have progressive conditions and that it's not fair to say that if you go to physical therapy and you don't get better, that you don't sort of deserve to have access to it. So this class action lawsuit was won by patients with a number of different diagnoses and it includes Parkinson's where lack of progress is not a reason that someone can be discharged from physical therapy. So one is to push back a little bit. If that's the reason someone is saying they're going to discharge you, say, you know, I'm aware of this class action lawsuit. Um, that's not a reason that I should be discharged. But like I said earlier, it's true that physical therapy can't just go on forever. So it may be that they're saying this is about a therapy. We've, you know, whether we made any progress, that's kind of a, you know, it's hard to know necessarily from this question. Um, but I would say that continuing to work with someone, trying to figure out some way, um, whether it's a personal trainer or a physical therapist in a somewhat different setting, or there's more and more programs now that are offering in-home exercise. Sometimes it's personal trainer, sometimes it's physical therapist. Um, sometimes even people will work with like a physical therapy student under the guidance. So the physical therapist who's discharging can say, here's the things to keep working on. Practice it to stand, practice walking, practice transfers. Um, I don't know if it would be an option, Joanne, for you to get a recumbent bike in your home potentially to be able to do some of that aerobic exercise. So that's what I would say is either really try to work with that PT to say, what can we do on our own and what other resources can we access to try to continue to make improvement? If that PT doesn't help you, look for someone else in the community. Um, and even an outpatient physical therapist, if it's someone who specializes in Parkinson's, potentially one visit with them would be helpful just saying, what are the things that we could do on our own? And then be able to try to kind of get some physical therapy again in a few months. And if your husband's able to do even some of those things, some on the bike, keep working on some of those exercises and is showing that he's making some improvement, that is a reason to bring physical therapy back in to continue to work on that progress. Um, so I would say, you know, keep pushing, looking for those resources in your area and know that there are things that can be helpful um, but sometimes it does just take a little bit of work to find those resources that's great to push back and that there's been that class action suit that you can reference I hope that that helps you and your husband Joanne yeah and so with especially Medicare basically the requirements are that somebody has to have what's considered skilled need which 
There's a lot of gray area with Medicare. It's very confusing, but skilled need is basically saying that the types of exercise you're doing in therapy is something that not just anyone could do. So I have to show, I have been educated and trained to do this and your spouse can't do the same thing that I do or a personal trainer can't do the same thing I do. It needs to be skilled. And then that person needs to have medical necessity. So those are really the two things that are required therapy to pay or for Medicare to pay for physical therapy. But it is true that it will not just pay forever all year round. So there is, there does need to be kind of a bout of therapy, work towards certain goals, figure out a discharge plan where people can work at least a degree on their own um, and figure out whatever resources they need. And when you show that that person is really like, that's something that Medicare actually cares about. The more that you are putting forth effort and working on finding those resources and showing what you're doing, they actually, that makes them more likely to want to pay for more therapy for you. So that's one of the things that as therapists, we need to basically be, when we're working with you, really figuring out a discharge plan of what are these things that you can do on your own? What other resources do you need to find so you can keep working? And then we'll get back in touch and I can show to Medicare, this person has worked on all these things. We now have new goals and new things to work on. And that's why it's appropriate to bring them back to physical therapy. Um, and then I see this other question here. So if you already have some dementia, does exercise maintain your current health or could it improve? So there is studies showing that actually cognition can improve with exercise. So even with the term dementia, that's, there's a big kind of spectrum of what that could mean. Um, but definitely in general, I would say exercise can be helpful at a minimum maintaining things. And in many cases, again, depending on the frequency and duration, there is very likelihood that it could actually improve things and be helpful. Um, so yes, I would definitely encourage that. And then any programs available on YouTube. So I don't know, like aerobic exercise is the one that I would actually say is likely to have the most impact on cognition. There's the most research to support it. So getting your heart rate up. Um, so it can be something relatively simple, like using a recumbent bike, but really pushing yourself to get your heart rate up. Um, and then other forms of exercise like amplitude training, other things, if the person can do it, can also be helpful. But aerobic exercise is probably the best place to start. And then on YouTube, there definitely are resources. Um, there is an organization in Austin that is called Power Over Parkinson's, I believe. And they actually have a lot of exercise classes and they record them and put them on YouTube. Um, I have exercises um, on YouTube and there are quite a few. So I would definitely recommend you look those up. And then I can also send a couple of those links um, to Rebecca and Andrea after this meeting. And then maybe that can be posted somewhere or sent out to the people who participated in this. But yeah, LSVT Big has some information. Uh, Parkinson Wellness Recovery has information. So there are a good amount of resources. And I would say it definitely does help though, if possible to work with a physical therapist, because sometimes it can be overwhelming. There actually are a lot of things out on like YouTube and on the internet. And knowing if that is the best thing for you to do, if it's safe, if it's going to be helpful, that's a little bit harder sometimes to tell on your own. So that's where like a physical therapist can really be helpful in saying these are like the kind of set of exercises or the videos that would be helpful to use at home so that they can be that right challenge point. Very good. And Denise, you had so many great comments, but um, earlier, along with those last questions, she also noted that the social aspect of group classes has a good benefit, which mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, it's huge. There actually, there was a study as well, and it was looking at people who come and do um, exercise in a chair, you know, so it's not necessarily as highly intense. It's more chair-based exercise, but they showed that even those people actually did, it was cognition, I think, that they showed the biggest improvement on, um, that yeah, getting in a group, being social, trying your best to do something new, that's all really, really healthy for the brain. So no matter what level you're at, it is good for you and helpful. Very good. Well, that hour flew by. And I feel we got more content than we usually do just because Claire is such a power talker. Do they teach that in power too? I, I, yeah. I'm from the East Coast. So to me, I'm like, yes, <laughs> it's just more efficient that way. Out here on the West Coast, sometimes people are, you know, more languid talkers. But <laughs> a little more laid back. Yeah. yeah. But I was like, oh, I have an hour. I'm going to get in two hours worth of information. You're welcome. We <laughs> yes, we did it. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. So thank you for your time and expertise and sharing all of that with us. 
Um, thank you to all of you who joined us from your homes. And I love it when we say goodbye. I know some of you have turned off your, your uh, cameras, but maybe if you could turn your camera on and we can all wave at each other. So from our little corner of the universe, we can see everyone else out there learning about exercise,